Yeah, um, thank you, Jeff. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, thank all of you for joining. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, and I hope um, you enjoy the presentation. We got a little sample yesterday, so um, I'm really excited for it. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that in the coming months, we will have um, a couple more events on the docket. We will have um, a doctor Q&A session um, for a coffee chat, as well as get you your RMD information. Um, and for those of you who don't know, an RMD is required minimum distribution. Um, so if you've heard that phrase, you're not sure about that phrase, um, or you know yeah. about that phrase and you wanna hear the updated rules, you'll wanna tune in for that. Um, so look forward to those invites in your inbox in um, the coming months. And then also just wanted to let all of you know that you can find our events on our website, which is www.steinfinancialgroup.com. Perfect, thank you, Lauren. Well, when, it, uh, when I meet new people for the first time, the, inve the inevitable question that comes up is, so what do you do for work? And my answer used to be that I help people make good decisions, smart decisions, usually about their finances, uh, but more broadly, just about their lives. That's what I used to say. Now, though, I add that uh, doing so means not only helping people make good decisions, it means above all else, helping them avoid making bad ones. But how do you make good decisions and how do we avoid those bad ones? The answers aren't so obvious and it, uh, sometimes um, it's something that my team and I are co uh, continually focused on. Whether you think decision making is an art or a science or a little of both, it's incredibly important in our lives. Our very special guest today is Daniel Adler. His career is also about making quality decisions, but for a slightly different outcome. We strive to provide you with financial peace of mind. Daniel strives to provide you with a baseball World Series champion. So to get into the swing of things here, <clears throat> Daniel, excuse me, is the assistant general manager for the Minnesota Twins and his very humble <laughs> educational resume includes an AB magna cum laude in economics and is with a secondary uh, in the field of psychology. In addition, Daniel has also earned his MBA and JD. And by the way, I don't know if I mentioned, they're all from Harvard. Uh, Daniel's career be, uh, began with Boston Consulting Group. And from there, he became the director of football research for the Jacksonville Jaguars of the National Football League. It was one of the first positions of its kind in the NFL. In 2017, da uh, Daniel joined the Minnesota Twins as director of baseball operations. The Twins list Daniel's duties as follows. Daniel will be involved in all facets of the Twins baseball strategy, including direct oversight of the club's baseball research and development staff. Additionally, he'll continue to have a key role in the areas of arbitration, roster construction, athletic performance, player acquisition, and player development. Daniel, what a fascinating journey that uh, has now led you to the Minnesota Twins. Thanks for taking the time today to be with us, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Take it away. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for that <clears throat> very kind introduction. I'm really uh, honored to be able to, uh, to talk to this group. I know Lawrence told me a little bit about the series, and uh, it sounds like a lot of exciting opportunities. So uh, excited to uh, lend my expertise here. So I'm going to share my screen and get this up here. Okay, so everybody, I hope everybody can see, uh, see the, main, the, the main screen here, if I could get a thumbs up. All right, so, uh, so today we're going to talk about, uh, about decision making. And uh, I want to start off with uh, a decision I faced a few years ago. Uh, this was uh, the seat back display on my flight. I was coming from Boston, flying to MSP. Um, I was coming back actually from seeing, uh, seeing a lot of my old coworkers play in the AFC championship game. The Jaguars were playing against uh, the New England Patriots. And uh, returning, returning from that flight, the game was on a Sunday, returning on a Monday, I was taking the day off work. I was still relatively new with the twins, so I was nervous about that. And then we encounter some bad weather. The flight had already been delayed. And as you can see, 
we uh, we circled around circled around uh, circled around MSP a number of times, and then the captain comes on and says, "We uh, we're unfortunately going to have to land in Chicago." And the whole flight, everybody let, lets out a collective groan, and he says, "We're going to hopefully be able to get everybody on a flight tomorrow morning." So we land in Chicago, and the, the first thing I do, I look up on uh, on Google Maps. I look up how how long is the drive because. I don't really feel like waiting around, figuring out a place to stay tonight. Uh, it might be a lot better, even though the weather's not so good. Maybe I'd be better off driving. Um, and this is the normal drive. It was a little longer because it was snowy. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's looking like six and a half hours. And I thought, you know what, it would probably just be better to get in a car and do this. And so weighed my options, thought about uh, how can I get there, looked at buses, bus schedule wasn't great ultimately decided that probably makes sense to just rent a car and, and do this. Let's not let any more time elapse. Um, and at that point, I, I'm still uh, kind of meandering around the gate, looking, looking around, everybody's figuring out what the heck they want to do. Uh, and I think, you know, it might not be a bad idea to see if there's somebody else who also wants to drive. And so I start sizing people up, looking around. Is there anybody who looks like they might want to make this drive with me? Uh, and I spot, I spot a, a young guy um, and I look at him and I think this might be an interesting person. I overhear on the phone, he's sa saying to somebody, yeah, I think I'm going to drive. And I'm debating, should I, should I ask this total stranger to drive, drive with me for you know, six and a half, maybe seven hours? And so I have a decision. I'm making a choice there. I look, o look over this guy. Um, he's got nice luggage, a fancy Tumi, Tumi uh, traveling luggage uh, set. He has an iPhone. He was in pretty good shape. I kind of put all these things together and they go into my gut, our main decision making unit. And I decide uh, this is maybe this is somebody uh, that would be reputable. Seems seems like a good enough person. I can probably trust them. Um, and I decide this is the person I want to go on the road with. Now, uh, of course, all these things also match the profile. If anybody uh, has seen the, a movie starring Christian Bale called American Psycho, uh, where he looks just like that. He's in good shape. He's got fancy clothes. Uh, and he ends up uh, being an axe murderer. So uh, clearly, whatever decision I was making uh, and the, the data I was taking in probably wasn't the best. Uh, it probably wasn't my best decision. Thankfully, uh, we drove and we made, it, we made it back to Minneapolis safely ended up sleeping in my own bed, making it to work on time the next day. My wife uh, was not so thrilled with that decision, to say the least. Uh, so that is one decision from my life. And I like to look back and, and say, how, how was that decision? Obviously worked out reasonably well, uh, but was the process good? And I will show this and we'll come back to this two by two matrix throughout the presentation. Uh, and on one axis, we have process. Was your process good or bad? Uh, and the other axis, we have outcome. Was the outcome good or bad? And you can see, kind of line it up. If you have good process and good outcome, you've got deserved success. If you have good process and a bad outcome, call that a bad break. If you have bad process and a good outcome, that's dumb luck. Uh, and if you have bad process, and a bad outcome, that's, that's poetic justice. You probably deserve to fail and, and you got just what you deserved. And so looking back at uh, my decision, uh, my process, not so good. We already saw, I, I was picking this road trip partner based on really irrelevant information. Um, thankfully I made it back safely. So the outcome was good. So I would firmly put that in the dumb luck box. And so uh, I think there's something valuable about looking back at our own decisions, even when they work out well. It's very easy. Most people have no problem saying, oh, yeah, that was a bad break. I, I really, I did everything right and it was a bad break. I also think it's really important to acknowledge when we've been lucky. Um, and so in this case, I'll very readily acknowledge that I made a bad decision, even though it worked out reasonably well for me. So now we're going to talk, the rest of the presentation is going to focus on different biases that get in the way of making good decisions, that make it so we're less likely to have good process and more likely to have bad process. And we'll talk about maybe some ways to overcome those. So I'll share a series of stories. At the end, we can, uh, if people have further questions, we can certainly dive in, dive in more, but want to um, share a number of uh, stories and academic studies uh, that 
uh, talk about different biases that get in the way of good decision making. I'm guessing many people here are probably familiar with, with a number of these um, uh, issues already, even if you haven't heard the fancy scientific name for them. So our first, uh, first example comes from, uh, comes from the Duke University campus. And uh, if you've ever been to Duke or you're a college basketball fan, this scene may, may look familiar. This is not, not a homeless encampment on the Duke campus, but this is actually what's called Krzyzewskiville, which is uh, named after their, their uh, longtime head coach. And students at Duke camp out, uh, in some cases for weeks, to get uh, tickets to Duke basketball games. Their, their arena is quite small, seating is limited, particularly for the games, big game against North Carolina, very, very competitive. And the way they dole out the tickets is actually students will essentially wait in line for weeks living in a tent. One of my good friends from high school, uh, his grades suffered uh, severely uh, when he lived in a tent for uh, months on end, but he did get to go to uh, the UNC game. And so um, there's an economist uh, named Dan Ariely who thought this might be an interesting place, uh, place for an experiment. I'm interested in the question of how much do students value these tickets? They've waited for weeks on end, uh, how much would they, if they have a ticket, how much would they be willing to sell it for? If they don't have a ticket, how much would they be willing to buy it for? And so what he did, which was very clever, was he looked at the students who were right on the edge, the last students to get tickets and the first students to miss out. So they've both been waiting for roughly the same amount of time. They're both very, very, both groups are very, very passionate basketball fans. And so we have one group didn't have tickets, one group that did. And so when they ask the group that didn't have tickets, they say, how much would you pay for a ticket to this game? The average bid was $170, which is a lot of money. These are college students. And this was a number of years ago. So that's, that's a really staggering sum, frankly, $170. These students really wanted to go to the game. And then they asked the students who had tickets, who just got the tickets. Remember, these are similar fans. They say, how much, uh, how much do you want to sell your ticket? And in theory, if, you're, if you, uh, you think, well, they want 170 to buy, you guess probably about 170 to sell. They asked them how much we want to sell, and the average uh, answer was $2,400. So something about having this ticket made people value it much, much more. And economists and psychologists uh, often refer to this, this concept as uh, either the endowment effect or loss aversion. Uh, essentially, once you have something, you value it uh, a whole lot more and you view anything less as a loss. And if you look at this little graph, you can see it's much steeper on the loss side. A loss of $5 is probably gonna make, make you very upset, whereas a gain of $5 uh, may not make you nearly, uh, nearly as happy. And so kind of, if you think about it in an emoji, we've got the loss, it's, a, it's terrifying to lose, We've got the gain. Yeah, yeah, it's it's nice to gain, but you know we don't really. Uh, it's not that big of a deal for us, and so uh, loss aversion can drive a whole lot of decisions in our life, and including uh, including baseball. And so a little example we like to look at: if you've watched our games recently, or really watched any baseball in recent years, you've probably seen that the way many teams position their infield has changed very significantly historically teams would uh, take their four infielders and position them more or less evenly throughout the diamond. Uh, and then uh, probably starting, it's, it's actually happened for many years, but it's become much more prevalent probably in the last five or so years. Teams now will position their players uh, much more in accordance with where players, uh, the batter typically hits the ball. Uh, and so if you watch, we uh, do this and we're much more likely to get ground ball out than uh, shifting, than having players positioned evenly. However, sometimes there are uh, situations where if the players were even, we would have gotten the ball and now we miss it. And so we would call those kind of bad shifts. Uh, and then the times when we get the ball that we wouldn't have gotten if we were positioned evenly, we call those good shifts. And so in 2019, uh, the Twins, we had 39 plays where our, our models categorized it as a good shift and 17 plays when we categorized it as a bad shift. So we'll play, uh, play the, uh, play this here. Let me, uh, hold on. 
on one second. Sorry, I, I got carried away. I got too too cocky with the arrow. So we're going to watch. This is an example of a bad shift that we'll watch here. So you see the second baseman. Uh, second baseman normally uh, in a traditional formation, he would have been positioned right there. Uh, and if you uh, heard the audio for that game, the announcers almost always immediately say, oh, second baseman would have been there. The pitcher's thinking it. Everybody's very upset. Uh, and then we look at this on the right. We look at an example of a good shift, a time when we wouldn't have made a play otherwise. So that ball was right up the middle. Historically in baseball, that's been a time where the ball just dribbles right up the middle. We have nobody there and we miss out. And so that's an example in baseball where we have these uh, bad shifts, which are, are felt as losses. Even though we only had 17 of them to 39 good, uh, you talk to some of our pitchers or you talk to our announcers and they say, I don't like the shift. And what is really happening there, I would say, is probably loss aversion. It's very, very painful when the ball goes through where we would have been, and it doesn't feel quite as good. Uh, it's helpful. We're happy about it, but not as happy as we are sad when the bad thing happens. So that's a little example of, of loss aversion uh, in baseball. Now we'll go back, uh, go back to this, uh, this two by two matrix. If I had a tattoo, this is exactly what it would be. Um, so go back. What other things can get, get in the way of process? And here, this part will be a little bit interactive. Um, I'm going to show you um, show you a graph, and this is a graph. And if you've seen this exact example, please don't chime in. But if you haven't, please uh, please unmute yourself for a moment, and we can talk about it. We have uh, a series of countries in gold. Uh, these are all countries in Europe. Series of countries in uh, in gold with relatively low rates of organ donation. You know, we have the Netherlands pop, uh, topping out about 28%, everything else much lower. And then we have these countries in blue uh, where they're all very high. Sweden's 86 and everything else is much, much higher. And, and my question is, uh, does anybody have any theories as to what might be driving the difference between these countries? The, the first set that has a very low rates of organ donation and the second set that has much, much higher rates of organ donation. I can wager a guess if nobody else wants to. Um, my guess would be that the countries with the high rate have a default opt in and the countries with the low, low rate have default opt out. Uh, Anthony, you, you've nailed it. And uh, unfortunately, usually it's much more fun if people say, well, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I've been to Denmark. They're, uh, they're very nice, but they're a little selfish. Austria, they're much more community minded. Um, but but you've, nailed, you've nailed precisely uh, precisely the situation. It's all about how they ask the question. So what happens with those gold countries? They, uh, they get the question, check this box if you want to participate in the organ donation program. What happens? People don't check the box. Uh, and what happens in the blue countries? They say, check this box if you do not want to participate in the organ donation program. What happens again? People don't check the box. So that means that they end up joining. And so this opt out framing uh, leads to much, much higher rates of, um, of organ donation. And this has been shown in basically every field possible. You look at companies where they say, do you want to, uh, do you want to uh, dedicate 10% of your salary to your 401k, check here if not. Guess what? People in those companies, they keep, they keep donating, or not donating, they keep uh, contributing 10% to their 401k. People at companies where they say, check here if you want to, much, much lower rates. So these are extremely um, important decisions. And, and is it because people are just uh, lazy that uh, they don't want to check a box? Not really. I think it's more uh, people tend to think, well, whoever made this form must have some idea. Um, and this concept uh, is really popularized in a book called Nudge by Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler. They have a lot of examples about the idea of they, what they call libertarian paternalism, which is you give people the choice. You still have the cho choice not to join. However, we're going to nudge you. We're going to nudge you in the direction 
of making what we think is the better choice. Now, the question is, who's making that form? Do we trust them? That's, that's a much bigger question. But um, in theory, if the person doing that has the best interests of the individuals and society, that can be uh, very, very helpful. Now, I spent, uh, as Jeff mentioned, I spent a number of years working in football. And uh, in football, a decision that, that I would argue teams uh, still to this day don't, don't really optimize is fourth down decisions. And so what happens on fourth down? Usually, if you watch a football game, you see the punt team. If it's third down and the team fails, you see the punt team, even before the coach gives the signal, the punt team's already running onto the field. And so I would argue that the coaches are basically saying, I have to check the box. I have to go against the grain and make this active decision. And what happens? They usually don't go for it. I would argue if you could change the default to, uh, hey, instead of telling the punt team you're going out automatically, I have to actively call them on, I'm guessing teams would be much more likely to go for it on fourth down. So the fourth down, um, changing that default may really impact football decisions. And this actually is a picture I took going back to that, uh, the AFC championship game that I went for. This is a fourth down and you can see immediately the special teams group is already, already coming on the field. And so that's what happens um, quite frequently in football, that there's this default. It's very, very important. In baseball, the default decision for a pitcher is usually to throw a fastball. And uh, typically, I, I won't get into um, all of the advanced stats, but WOBA, this, this column WOBA is a stat we use a lot. It's uh, similar to batting average, um, but accounts for a little more, accounts for uh, the value of a home run, a double, a triple, and walks. And so it's a pretty good all-encompassing stat. And as you can see, uh, every baseball team knows this, that when you throw fastballs, your WOBA is about 359. When you throw breaking balls, it's about 276. And change-ups are about 282. So clearly, these non-fastballs are much more successful. Um, and one, example, one difference uh, is that sometimes people are throwing those non-fastballs in uh, in uh, counts that are very favorable for the pitcher. Um, and that is a valid, um, valid consideration. I'll hear that from, from coaches. Well, sure, of course, your curveball is going to be good. You only throw it when the count is zero balls, two strikes. And so the batter really has to swing in anything because he's, he's very afraid of striking out. Uh, he's, he maybe is going to chase something outside the zone because he doesn't want to watch strike three. And so even if you look at this, let's just look at full counts. Uh, even if you look at just full counts, it's true that the value difference between the fastball and the others changes. But again, we still see this. Uh, we still see this difference that the non-fastballs are substantially better. So again, uh, we have this default of a fastball. Pitchers for many, many years have always been told, establish your fastball. That's the default. And, uh, you know, we found that we really probably should be throwing more secondary pitches. Um, here's something. This is just sort of a cool look at some of the uh, types of, of graphs we use. This is um, just a color coded. This is the type of thing we would show to our pitchers. Um, this is color coded uh, based on where the hitters, it's a heat map, so where the hitters are doing the most damage. So red, you can see fastballs down the middle are the most damage. Fastballs kind of on the edge players have a lot of trouble with. But you can see overall, fastballs, they have this big red spot, whereas sliders, there's really no red. And so one of the takeaways from this can be, well, these pitchers uh, probably should just avoid fastballs uh, a lot more than they do. So again, um, we look at what's the default in baseball. Usually for the catcher, um, it's the question of check this box if you want to throw an off-speed pitch when the catcher is calling it. Players and coaches usually don't check the box. They don't throw off speed. Uh, maybe we could change that framing if we say, okay, the baseline is we're going to throw a slider and we have to actively make that decision to throw a fastball. I would argue that we'd probably end up uh, throwing a lot more, um, a lot more non fastballs. And so um, this is, you know, if for twins fans among us, this is uh, throughout, um, throughout the minor leagues, this is the percentage of fastballs the twins throw. And so in 2017, when I joined the team, we were at about 60%. 2018 was 59. Last year, we made a very, very conscious effort. It was only 51%. Uh, 
Um, and you can see we were we threw the third fewest fastballs of any team in baseball. And um, you know, we've had uh, been an up and down year on the field, but we've had, I think, a lot of uh, a lot of success with our pitching. And in some cases, pitching prospects who aren't that heralded. And, and I would certainly attribute some of that pitch selection that our coaches have really emphasized to some of our success that we've maybe been over able to overcome some of those defaults. Um, so we've talked about, uh, we've talked about loss aversion. We've talked about defaults. Uh, we're going to get back to other things that can get in the way of good process. Um, and this is one of my favorite examples. This is really, uh, really a fun one. And so the idea here is that uh, irrelevant choices should not change our decision. What, what do I mean by that? So you go, let's say you go to, uh, go to a restaurant and they say, um, we have three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. And I'm looking at, uh, at Alan here. Uh, Alan, I'm going to say that you've ordered, you've ordered vanilla. And so he orders vanilla. And then we say, actually, Alan, we have some bad news. We're out, we're all out of strawberry. And you say, well, uh, that's fine. I, I, ordered, I ordered vanilla. Um, but in fact, there's times where we say we're all out of strawberry, and then you say, okay, well, in that case, I'll have chocolate. Now, this sounds totally ridiculous when I give this example with, with ice cream flavors, but here's an example where, where this actually really happens, and you can see how some of these irrelevant factors can shape, shape our decision. So this is, uh, this is The Economist. Many people here may, uh, may subscribe to the magazine. And this, was, this used to be on their website. So they had three options where you could sign up. So this is sort of the chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry situation. They have uh, an online subscription, which is 50, uh, $59. They have a print subscription, which is $125. And then they have a print and online subscription, which is also $125. So when you see this, immediately you think, well, no bozo is going to choose the, the print only. You may as well, for the same price, you may as well get the print and online. And what happens when they have these three choices? This is precisely what happened. Literally, nobody's choosing just the print. 16% of people want the online. 84% of people want, the, want both. Okay, so that's, that's our first, first setup. So that's when we have chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Now, they say, well, nobody was choosing the print subscription only. Why don't we stop offering that? And then they say, okay, how do people react? Remember, nobody chose this at all. So in theory, there'd be no reason why anybody would change their decision. Nobody wanted that, that strawberry. Nobody wanted the print subscription. Uh, and what happens though, when you remove the print subscription, it completely flips. So now when people are faced with these two decisions, they, uh, many more people actually choose to get just the online subscription. And so what's happening here? People say, it's hard making that decision. Do I want to spend 59 or 125? That's pretty difficult. I don't really know. There's pluses and minuses to it. However, I know for sure that the print and web is way better than this option B here, this print only. So I'm just going to choose that. Um, and so that's kind of the shorthand where people are making decisions. Now, how can this happen in baseball? I think a reasonable example, when we're in the draft, uh, in baseball, the scouting scale typically goes two to eight. Uh, eight would be somebody like Mike Trout. Two is a player we never think would make the major. So if we have three players to choose from, two catchers and one starting pitcher, we have a starting pitcher that we have a six roll grade. We have a catcher that we have a six roll grade. And we have a catcher that we have a five roll grade. My theory, if, uh, if decision-making plays out a little like it did in that economist situation, if you're looking at these three players together, I would say you may be most likely to choose the catcher. But immediately, if you eliminate, you'd be mo most likely to choose this better catcher, this uh, option number two. However, I would guess that if you eliminate option number three, it becomes a lot harder. And maybe you flip and you say, well, it's hard to know. Do I want a pitcher more or a catcher? We have the same grade on them. And you would take, maybe you would take the pitcher. Again, not for sure. You may still stick with the catcher, but I would argue that uh, you're better off or you're going to be much more likely to choose the catcher if there's that worse catcher uh, available there. So uh, one of the, Dan Ariely, the economist I mentioned uh, earlier, one of the examples that, that he uses is if you're uh, going out to try to, to meet a partner, 
you should find somebody who's a, a slightly worse looking version of yourself to go out with them because then you'll look good compared to that person. Uh, and that gives people sort of that irrelevant choice that elevates, uh, elevates one of the decisions. Um, so now we've talked about a number of, number of different things that get in the way. If we go back to our, our two by two matrix here. Um, another external factor that influences decisions uh, that can get in the way and cause bad process uh, is something that's called uh, anchoring. And, and what that is, is anchoring, uh, not, nothing to do with nautical, uh, nautical theme, although I do have that the little actual anchor up here. But what it is, is the anchor is the starting point for our estimation. And it can have a huge effect on determining a person's response. And so what do I mean by this? If you ask somebody, is Mount Everest more or less than 80,000 feet tall? So at 80,000 is now an anchor. And then I say, how tall is it? That's gonna elicit a very different response from is Mount Everest more or less than 10,000 feet tall? How tall is it? And now why is this happening? Um, people tend to use the anchor as a hint. They, uh, much like an anchor on a boat, you don't stray far enough away. You'll recall memories consistent with the anchor. If I give uh, 80,000, you, you may be thinking, uh, well, a, a flight, I've heard 30,000 feet and you got to go much higher than that. Everest, uh, versus if I give 10,000, maybe you're thinking about skyscrapers uh, and how Everest compares there. So all these things add up, the anchor usually having a big impact. Um, and so yesterday uh, and, and previously, we did a survey where we had two different versions of the survey uh, where each person uh, got one version and uh, every single question, there was a high anchor and a low anchor and they alternated. So version A of the survey had uh, a high anchor question, then a low anchor question, high anchor, low anchor. Version B was low, high, low, high. So the question, uh, so the first example, and these are your actual, actual responses from, uh, from this group. So the first question was, is the Nile River more or less than 7,500. So that's the high anchor. And the average answer was about 4,400 miles. Uh, second, second group got, is it more or less than 500 miles? The average answer was about 1,400 miles. So again, this group isn't, they're not experts in the Nile River, but still pretty interesting to see this anchor had, uh, had a really very large effect. The actual answer is, you know, in between the two anchors is about 4,000 miles. Um, the city of London. My guess is many people here have, have been to London. So question was, uh, the high anchor, is London's urban population more or less than 20 million, which seems very, very high. Uh, and, and most people appreciated that. They said, uh, no, that's, that's too high. The average guess was about 14.2 million. Um, and then the low anchor was 2 million. Uh, again, 2 million, you know, just even though, even if you're not a, an expert in cities, that probably feels pretty low for a city as, as world renowned and as large as London. Um, and people did appreciate that. The average guess was of over 5 million. Um, and now the real answer, again, somewhere in between about, about 10 million. So we see London, a city, many people here have probably visited uh, this anchor, really, really large, large effect. Um, elephants, uh, again, we probably don't have uh, many animal experts on, uh, on this call. The question of uh, what is the gestation period uh, for an African elephant, uh, 46 months was our high anchor, which seems very, very long. Um, and the average guess was about 26 months. So people thought, okay, it's you know, over a two year pregnancy. Um, when we give a much shorter, um, uh, shorter span as our low anchor, we saw, so the six month anchor, we see an average answer of 12.2 months. So people knew, okay, like six months, that seems too, too low. And I'm going to compare that to a human pregnancy. Elephants are much bigger. Maybe that would make sense. So we see an average uh, higher than the anchor, but again, still a huge disparity between these two. Um, the actual answer is 22 months. Uh, now, next one, we moved, uh, asked a question about baseball and uh, how people, um, how people think the Toronto Blue Jays will do in 2021. Now, there's also some real questions about how many games we'll play in 2021, but we'll leave that aside for now. Um, the high anchor for the Blue Jays uh, that I gave was 98 wins, which would be a very, very high number of wins. Last year, we had 
We had over 100, but that's very, very rare. So a high, a high anchor, and the average was 62. So this group really uh, didn't, doesn't think very fondly of the Blue Jays, doesn't think that they'll be a particularly good team, or maybe doesn't think that um, we'll play a lot of games next year, which is uh, both are very possible. So the high anchor group, the average guess was 62. For the low anchor group, uh, I put 58 games, and the average guess was uh, was under 40. So again, really, really large, large disparity here that this anchor, um, again, we asked kind of two questions in a row, but all we really cared about was the number. Um, the anchor had really profound effect. Real answer, of course, we don't, we don't know. Um, now the last one, this was uh, a historical question um, about what the S&P close was just about three years ago to the day. And uh, the way I, I worded the question, I said, was the closing price more or less than 3,588, which is the current five-year high. So by definition, I've literally told you it was lower than that because that's the high. So it couldn't have been more than that. Um, and, and people knew and understood that. And they said, yep, you're right. Uh, and the average guess was 2,955. Now, when with the second group, and you can imagine where this is going, I gave a, a low anchor of the current five-year low, which is 1,810. And so again, you knew, I guess it could conceivably be right at that number, but you knew it was probably much more likely uh, that it was well, well above that. And so when you give that anchor of 1,810, what was the uh, average guess? It was 1,903. So this is a group everybody here uh, has at least some passing familiarity with the S&P and thinks about their finances. And again, that anchor uh, has a really, really big effect. And I, I don't want anybody to feel bad because I've done this test with um, NFL scouts, with baseball coaches about their expertise. I've asked about a player where that player is going to be drafted. Is he going to be a top 10 pick or a top 100 pick? And again, you see the anchor really, really plays a big role. And so um, this is just fascinating and something to be very aware of because it can get in the way of good decision making here. Um, I have one other anchoring example. These are these have all been numerical, but one other that, that I think about very frequently. And this is a, a real favorite of mine. This is a, a test they did at MIT uh, years ago where the setup was they had um, a substitute teacher for the day. He was coming in to lecture to a class and they said, we don't have time uh, for this teacher to introduce himself. We have distributed a little background on, on him and he's just gonna go right into it. Uh, and then uh, you will, you'll just hear a normal lecture. So what they did was they gave everybody these, uh, these biographies and the biography they gave out, uh, as you may sense a trend, there were two versions, much like, um, much like what, uh, what I did with this quiz beforehand. Uh, and everything in the two versions was the exact same except two words. And so what it said was Mr. Blank, he's a graduate student at, in the Department of Economics and Social Science here at MIT. He has had three semesters of teaching experience in psychology at another college. This is his first semester teaching X70. He is 26 years old, a veteran and married. People who know him consider him to be a and one version got very warm person, industrious, critical, practical, and determined. The other version got rather cold, but then all the other adjectives were the exact same. So people got this. This was their anchor, essentially, that was set. They got this background, and then they watched this uh, person lecture for an entire hour. And after the hour, they said, what did you think of him? Uh, and the people who got the very warm version, they said, he's good natured considerate of others, informal, sociable, popular, humorous, humane, all kinds of positive things. And then the group that, that got the rather cold, and remember, it wasn't highlighted like this. It was just two small words in there. Uh, they said he's irritable, self-centered, formal, unsociable, unpopular, humorless, and ruthless. They all watched the exact same lecture for an entire hour, and yet these two words totally changed the way they viewed this person. So uh, this is why it's very, very important that Jeff gave me a very warm introduction here. Uh, and so hopefully everybody's anchored, uh, for my sake, hopefully everybody has anchored off of that. So really, really fascinating to see 
Uh, we talked about some numerical versions of anchoring, but also really uh, that that first impression or somebody, uh, you know, we think about this a lot when we're interviewing. We try really hard not to, you know, do the little wink when one person is going from interviewer A to B and not say, oh, hey, I thought that person was really great, because that can have a huge impact on how you view uh, view a candidate and, uh, and ultimately have a very big impact on your decision. Um, so talk about, again, kind of coming back to the, the tattoo here, other things that can get in the way of process. Uh, one of those is that our memories are, are not always very good. And this, this example is uh, slightly graphic, I would say, and so not, not entirely for the, the faint of heart, but um, we, I won't ask anybody for uh, their most recent colonoscopy information, but uh, if you have not had a colonoscopy, and this, is, um, this test was run um, on colonoscopies where people were not under general anesthesia, so they were awake, and um, you know, all you really need to know is that uh, the colonoscope goes inside your body, uh, not, not through your mouth, um, and uh, it is um, uh, typically pretty painful. Uh, it's moving around, you know, searching, searching your colon for polyps. And um, my understanding is there are moments, though, where the pain, pain changes. Sometimes when it's moving around a lot, it's very, very painful. Sometimes it's much less painful. And so what they did uh, for this, uh, this study was the control group had a regular colonoscopy. Um, just, you know, the standard, they go in there, and this was not under general anesthesia. The treatment group, uh, and nobody would want to sign up for this, the treatment group uh, was regular colonoscopy, but the procedure was lengthened by one minute with the colonoscope still inside the person's body, but stationary. So it wasn't moving around. So it was less painful than other moments. Um, they did not explain to subjects what was happening. They didn't say, we're leaving this inside you for an extra minute. Um, in fact, this, uh, this study there we can have a separate dis uh, discussion on ethical studies. Uh, this happened in Canada. My guess is it would be very unlikely you'd be allowed to do this type of study. But at this point, we have the information. I think it's very revealing about uh, human nature. And so, uh, so that's that's the story here. So you see, we have the control group. They've got this 15 minutes um, of, of pain, and you can see it kind of goes up and down, and it ends you know at a relatively high point. And then we have this, uh, the treatment group. Everything was the exact same, you know, same exact procedure. But then at the end, they have this one extra minute of relatively low pain. And so the peak pain that they experienced was the same. However, the end pain um, for the treatment group was much lower. And the question the researchers asked was, which patient uh, is more likely to return for their next scheduled colonoscopy? And this is in a lot of ways, a true truth serum, uh, because if uh, if you don't like the experience, you're probably much less likely to show up for your next one. And the answer, um, surprisingly, in a lot of ways, was the treatment group that overall, remember, they had this extra minute of badness, but the treatment group was actually much more likely to come back for their next procedure. And what's happening there is when we remember something, it's really hard to truly add all of this pain up and say, that was my experience. However, what, what ends up happening is we remember the most extreme part, and we also remember the end in a, in a way, and we weight that much more. And so what has happened here is the end, that peak end uh, decision-making has led this, this treatment group with the one extra minute to actually um, to be much more likely to return. So very, very interesting finding. Um, and we've all had this where you have a bad experience, but it ends okay. And maybe you decide it wasn't all that bad. So very, very, very interesting. Um, now, the question is, we've talked a lot about things that get in the way of, of uh, good process and create bad process. Now I'm going to talk for a couple minutes here about how we can uh, actually use, uh, use some tools and particularly statistical tools to overcome these problems and try to make better decisions. And so this one is extremely simple. Um, and uh, the thing that I think is really interesting, these are two players. This is from a few years ago, but 
Paul Goldschmidt, one of the best hitters in baseball. Justin Upton, also a good player. You can see Paul Goldschmidt hit 297. So he almost hit 300, which in baseball historically has been a little bit of a magic number that people think that's a real good hitter. Justin Upton hit 273. Very respectable batting average, um, but not, not, quite, uh, you know, not quite as impressive as 300. Now you break this out and you say, well, the season's about six months long. That means Paul Goldschmidt got about 6.4 hits per week, and Justin Upton got about 5.9 hits per week. So if I were to just watch the games, and this is such a, a simple thing, but if I were to just watch the games, it's about half a hit every week. Um, so that means once every two weeks, Paul Goldschmidt gets one more hit. That doesn't really seem like that much of a difference. If I'm not writing this down, I probably don't even notice it at all. Um, and so, but when we actually add it up, it's very significant. It makes this player on top much more valuable than the player on bottom. And so the small, small takeaway is you actually just sometimes need to write things down because if you just go off your memory, you may be like that treatment group where you've actually chosen the worst experience. And so if you're just watching baseball games, even seriously, it may be hard to perceive that one extra hit every couple of weeks that Paul Goldschmidt has. Um, now, in basketball, something that is uh, very interesting, if you have watched into the NBA playoff, probably seen teams shooting a lot more three-pointers. And the very basic math here, uh, three is obviously more than two. Every time you take a shot, you want to think about what are my chances of making the shot? And then what, is, what are the um, number of points I get for making it? And this was the calculus in 2010-2011. It was Teams, people made uh, the two-point shots a little less than half the time. The average, you know, the expected value was just under one per one point per shot. However, when they took three-pointers, they made them a little more than a third of the time, and thus the expected value was 1.074 per shot. So every three-pointer had an expected value of 0.1 points per, game, uh, per shot higher. Now, it doesn't really seem like that big a deal. However, if you think about it, you take teams take about 100 shots during the course of a game. And so if you were taking three-pointers, and you can't take all three-pointers, that would be a little ridiculous. But if you were taking three-pointers, that's going to add up to 10 extra points a game, which is a huge, huge deal. But what happened in the NBA for many years, and it's a little bit back to the loss aversion, uh, it feels bad to miss more shots. You have these, um, you're just less likely, uh, you're not making these as frequently, even though your gain is larger, maybe you're not totally appreciating it. Um, and so this is something that NBA teams have now really started to understand. This is from that 2010, 2011 season. This is the shot chart. So green is a made shot, red is a missed shot. You can see um, teams, this is the Memphis Grizzlies. I just pulled a, a random team. This is where they were shooting, shooting their shots. And you can see a little bit of a pattern. Everybody recognized, well, I shouldn't shoot a three-pointer. I shouldn't shoot a, a two-pointer just in front of the three-point line because that's almost as hard to make and it's only worth two. So you see there's a little bit of a white space right along the line. However, you just see a, a basically kind of random scatter all throughout here. Again, like a little less maybe in some of these areas that, that players have trouble. Now, how does that compare with how teams are acting today? This is the Houston Rockets from just six years later. And you can see this is their entire season where they're shooting. And they have almost no shots. And remember, in these concentrated areas, there's so many dots, you can't really appreciate it. But they have almost no shots, so few over the course of the season that are in this mid two-point range. Because these shots, you're making them at a relatively low clip probably a little bit higher than three-pointers, but they're not, not so easy to make, and they only count for two. So you see these teams really ad um, adapted their play, understanding the math. And if you look through the NBA, this is, uh, I, so the teams in red are the number of three-point attempts per game for uh, uh, teams in the 2003-2004 season. Teams in green are the 2016-2017 season. And you can see the team with the second most three-pointer attempts 
in 2004 would have had the absolute fewest in 2017. And so really major, major, major changes in how teams act because they started doing that math. They understand, they understand the data. Um, this is a, a screenshot of uh, just a, a recent game. This was from the 2019 season, but you can see almost all the shots were either very close twos or uh, three pointers. Neither team, you know, there were just a handful of shots that were not either short twos or threes. Um, so this is really NBA teams have really grasped this concept. Um, now, uh, I want to leave before before we end and get to a couple of questions. I want to leave with a little story um, uh, that should remind us to remain humble, especially when dealing with data. And this is a story of a concept called catcher framing, which is basically the way the catcher um, receives the ball that the theory is uh, the umpire is impacted by that. And maybe if the catcher catches the ball very smoothly and positions it right, he is more likely to, uh, to turn a, a, a pitch that was right on the edge into a strike, which could be very valuable. This is a concept that scouts and a lot of kind of quote old school people talked about for a long time. And it was something that statistical people like myself sort of poo pooed. We said, we don't have any data on this. That sounds exactly, that sounds like black magic. What are you talking about? That's not something we should value. Um, and then it turned out uh, years later, we started to get, uh, we got new data. We got data exactly where every single pitch goes. And we saw, oh my goodness, there are catchers who are really good at this skill. And so this is Mitch Garver. And you can see Mitch um, in the 2019 season made a really big effort to try to get, turn low pitches into strikes. And this is the area we've identified as being the most impactful. You can see he actually was worse than average. Uh, he was blue, which is bad, on the higher pitches. Um, but Mitch made a, a huge, huge effort. Um, and that's something that in our organization five years ago, we wouldn't have appreciated. But now we have better data and it turned out that it actually validated a lot of the kind of old school ideas. And so I'll leave and we'll show um, so you can see Mitch is really good at taking pitches that are maybe just outside of the strike zone and presenting it the way he catches it, presenting it in a way that the umpire is essentially fooled. And so I'll play a very quick one here. So you can see where that pitch actually, uh, actually went across the plate. Um, you know, it's actually just outside of the box and you see the umpire, he's calling it a strike. And that's very purposeful. Mitch has learned how to line up, how to catch the ball that way. But that is something, uh, the story of catcher framing in my mind is something that we didn't appreciate. We didn't have the right data. And there were people, myself included, who probably weren't respectful enough of people who told us, this is important. You, you're just not looking at it the right way. So uh, really a, a note of humility. And we should always remember um, everything we do, we're probably uh, going to learn and get more information and, and realize that we've maybe been wrong in different ways. Even infield shifting, we're starting to look at more data that shows there may be some questions whether that's actually the best approach. So wanted to um, leave, leave with that note. Um, but to conclude, um, you know, even in situations where we're relatively informed, cognitive biases such as anchoring, confirmation bias, loss aversion, and defaults, can impact our decision as we've seen today. Um, being aware of these biases can help you over, overcome them. And also systematic analysis, like we, like we showed, can really help reduce bias. Um, and if you enjoy this, um, there's a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by a professor named Daniel Kahneman that I'd highly recommend. Also another book by a poker player, uh, Annie Duke, called Thinking in Bets is uh, a really also a really fun, fun read. Um, if you didn't like this presentation, uh, much like the colonoscopy, let this be the last image. I think everybody likes seeing a, a dog and an orangutan. And so let that be the last thing that you remember. And you'll probably probably go home and say, yeah, it was fine. So uh, that, that is all I, uh, all I have. I'll stop, stop sharing here. And we have, I know, just a few minutes for, uh, for questions. I'm sorry that I went a little longer than, uh, than expected.
Yeah, and if you have questions, you can go ahead and pop them in the chat box or unmute yourself either way. Daniel, outstanding job with um, our clients. Um, loss aversion or risk aversion is a big, big deal. Uh, uh, we know that it hurts a lot more for them to lose one or two percent versus making the five, six or seven percent. Um, <clears throat> And um, I just loved your insight about, uh, um, you know, I noticed our pitchers are kind of following along in uh, throwing the type of uh, pitches that you were talking about here. I don't know whether that was by choice or by default, but um, we have um, um, a, a set of pitchers right now that uh, don't necessarily in many cases throw the hardest, but uh, are very good at spotting pitches and very good uh, with uh, alternate pitches, alternate uh, pitches other than a fastball. Yeah, that, um, it, first of all, it's helped. If you can throw 100, uh, that's also really good. We don't have too many of those guys. Um, and so we, we feel like, uh, you know, a pitcher like Matt Whistler, who we claimed on waivers, who's throwing a lot of sliders. Uh, we saw that he had a very good slider and thought he could be using that more. Um, and so he's been, now it's very early in the season, or it, it, we still have a very small sample, um, but he's been successful with that. And that, that has been a uh, purposeful move for us. Again, it, it's unique to every pitcher. So it's not just that every guy should be throwing more sliders or curveballs, but we do have some players that maybe we felt the market didn't, didn't fully value, and, and those are guys we were able to acquire either through trade or free agency. Um, and it's so far, uh, so far, so so good. But certainly don't want to get cocky because uh, there's uh, a, a fair amount of, of season left, and uh, it's relatively. Again, all these are pretty small samples. We're still only uh, 45 games in, which you know normally would be um, you know just just over a quarter of the season. Other questions for Daniel? I did neglect to tell everybody what a warm individual Daniel was, <laughs> and I apologize for that, but uh, absolutely the case. Um, you know, if you could fill any slot going forward, let's say for next year, um, what areas would you be looking to build? Is it uh, pitching? Is it uh, 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 the infield, the outfield, um, catching? Uh, you know, it's, it's tough to say um, exactly how the, the rest of the season will play out. Probably um, starting pitching, if you look at the players we have um, under contract for next year with um, Jake Odorizzi becoming a free agent after this year, Homer Bailey will be a free agent. Rich Hill will be a free agent. We'll probably have um, some slots to fill there. Now, Randy Dobnak um, is somebody we, you know, felt was a, um, a solid player and he's performed probably better, uh, better than we expected. And hopefully he can be a real stalwart in the rotation, but you know, we will be, um, you know, we have some interesting prospects coming up, but you could probably, I think it's, it's always a good rule that you could, uh, you could use, use more pitching, but We'll see uh, see how things play out. This will be a very uh, very interesting off season, and it's difficult. We don't even know how many games there will be next year. Could be a full season, could be shorter. Um, so it's it's really uh, challenging for us to uh, to plan right now. Okay. Yeah. Say, uh, I have a question, Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, uh, Daniel. Uh, I'm curious uh, as you showed how the strike zone changes and what pitchers need to know about the batters and what infielders need to know about the batters if they're going to switch around and do uh, a different kind of configuration. Uh, I've never played baseball. I have no idea what it looks like in the pregame analysis to know who's doing all this instruction. Are you part of that? And are all the, the coaches, pitching coaches, infield coaches, everybody part of that? Uh, that process of make that information available? Yeah, so it's a very much a team effort. We have um, about three, maybe even four analysts who really are primarily dedicated 
to providing information to the major league team and working closely with the coaches. Uh, two of them travel with the team uh, on the road and they're with the team all the time. Two are around the team a lot during the season. Um, I, in a normal year, I'll probably check in with our coaches and uh, you know get get lunch with a coach or two every series. Um, this year, due to coronavirus, I haven't been around the team physically, but um, I'll talk to the coaches. But we have um, a few analysts who are really dedicated um, to to producing those reports um, and communicating that information to most of most of the time. They talk to the coaches, and then the coaches relay it to the players. But we do have a number of players who are, are pretty cerebral and, and really want to dig in deep on their data, and they'll work directly with our analysts as well. Other questions for Daniel? I have a question. Um, football and baseball are pretty different sports. So, like, what made you decide to switch to baseball and, like, how – what was that transition like? Yeah, good, good question. Obviously, something I, I thought about a lot when joining the Twins. The the data in baseball is significantly richer um, for one reason that we have 162 games rather than 16, um, and so that that part was appealing. Feeling like we we certainly don't have all the answers, but uh, I do think our our projections are better, and there's maybe more we can add. Um, baseball's also further along on, on what I would kind of call the analytical adoption curve. And so the plus of that is, uh, you know, all of our coaches are, are pretty fluent in, um, in a lot of our advanced statistics. Um, the minus of that is um, when, when we find an advantage in the front office, maybe it's, um, maybe it's shifting, maybe it's uh, throwing more non-fastballs, those advantages tend to be arbitraged out pretty quickly. Whereas in football, I think um, teams, there aren't as many analytically minded teams and you can probably enjoy some of those advantages a little longer. But ultimately the appealing thing, I had a bit of a, a prior relationship with our president of baseball operations, Derek Falvey, and I knew, um, I, I got an idea of what Derek was building with the twins in the front office. And um, I think the results on the field have been have been solid, but also what a lot of fans can't see is just the, the massive investments we've made in research and player development. And we're really hopeful that those will lead to um, sustained success, even though it is very difficult. But you know, hearing, hearing Derek's vision and the chance to build out um, a department in a way that really no football team was quite ready to do. You know, we have, depending on how you count it and, and don't circulate this around, but we have, um, you know, certainly more than a dozen, probably closer to about two dozen people who would be categorized as, as analysts or computer programmers. And th those kinds of resources just weren't available to football teams. And so the chance to really do this right and sort of be part of, of building an all-star group um, was very, was very, very appealing. And so that, that's been a lot of, uh, a lot of fun. Other questions for Daniel? Well, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Again, if you have a question but are hesitant to ask it in front of everybody else, send it to us and we'll forward it to Daniel and uh, we'll disseminate it back out. Uh, this uh, presentation has been recorded, so uh, it will give you an opportunity if you'd like to view it again or you can forward it to a friend. and. Um, uh, allow them to kind of catch up on some of this wisdom here. Um, just personally, one, thank you so much, Daniel, and PJ, who is uh, hiding behind uh, a blank screen there for putting this all together with us. Uh, you've been incredibly generous with your time and your knowledge. Um, personally, I am incredibly frightened by uh, Daniel, the uh, the insights that you have in these different things. And um, uh, I don't know whether, um, you know, playing poker with you would be uh, a wise choice or not. I think you have uh, too many tells that uh, you're able to uh, utilize here, uh, yeah. or potentially I feel manipulated by some of these things. But <laughs> it was just a fascinating presentation. And uh, we all truly appreciate the opportunity to have heard you speak. So thank you.
And uh, I personally will be very excited to continue to watch uh, your career arc because uh, I, I sense incredibly great things for you. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Always, always fun, fun to spread, uh, spread these ideas. Just don't, don't share the presentation with any, uh, any other teams. I don't think I gave away any state secrets, but hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody can, can draw on some of these ideas. And I, I wish I could say I, I make perfect decisions more, more often than not, I find myself uh, just second guessing and saying, oh, yep, that was a very bad decision and I know why. So uh, I, you shouldn't be, if you ever see me at the poker table, don't be too afraid. I'm not, I'm not all that good. <laughs> all right. Can I ask one last question? One last question quickly. Uh, Daniel, you know, with all your, your educational background, uh, uh, certainly uh, an MBA and uh, in a law degree, if you were could do it over again, knowing what you know right now, would there be another course of instruction that you would have gone into? I don't know how law feeds into what you're doing now. It certainly always helps your thinking. The MBA, I could see, but do you wish you had had a, uh, an advanced computer degree uh, to process all this data? Uh, I think you, you nailed it. When I was finishing undergrad and, and during undergrad, I was very lucky to um, work for um, the Cleveland Browns as an intern in their salary cap group. And at the time, that was sort of the only route for a non-playing background was contract negotiation. And I, I really do enjoy that. Um, but and so my my thinking when I went to law school and originally embarked on the path was you probably have to have a law background. And now that has changed a lot in front offices in both baseball and football. And I think if I were in school now, I probably would be going down a little more of a, a data science path, um, maybe computer science, maybe something more um, in uh, statistics or applied math. Than, um, than the law degree. Um, but yeah, I think that you, you sort, of, uh, sort of nailed that. And the world truly, um, even baseball, baseball teams probably only had a few people working in these roles when I was an undergrad. It's many, many more now. Football teams, it was pretty much zero uh, at the time. So um, yeah, the world, the world is, this, this world in particular has um, changed very, very rapidly. Lauren, I'll let you wrap it up. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thanks so much, Daniel. I really appreciate it. That presentation was awesome. Um, and thanks to everyone who could join us today. Um, if you have any questions for Daniel, you can email me directly at lblair at steinfg.com. Otherwise, you can email Margie. You know us, you know the team. So go ahead and send us an email and we'll get it to Daniel. And thanks again, Daniel. Thanks, everybody, and let's go twins. Go twins. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks.